Hey friends, it's Riskit and welcome to another installment in my Deluge video manual where I'm going to be showing you everything I know about using the Synthstrom Deluge. In this video, we're going to go over the effects section and a bit of the modulation matrix section as well. So kicking things off, let's talk a little bit about this effect entire button. You can toggle this on and off depending on what you have selected. So at the moment we have a synth track, so these effects will always affect the entire sound of a synth. But if we switch to kit track, we can turn this on and off and we can say we want these effects to affect the entire clip. If we go into song view, we can say that we want these effects to affect the entire song. So if we have multiple tracks here, this button is going to mean that when we twist these knobs, these effects will be implied across the entire song. So we'll play around a bit with that as we go through, but let's kick off with a simple drum beat. So just a quick reminder, as discussed in the previous videos, don't forget that we also have a swing option up here. Swing is a global effect. So when you turn swing on, it's going to affect your entire track the same way the tempo knob does. To hear what that sounds like, let's just throw in a couple of extra snares and press play. All right, now we'll start turning on the swing. So these notes are sort of nudged together a little bit closer now. This way you can get really bouncy rhythms going and uh, don't forget that swing also works in the reverse direction as well. So if you look closely at the front panel of the Deluge, we can see that a lot of these effects that are listed up here are also listed across the front panel. Basically what these are, are shortcuts for these effects. For example, we can see over here, we have the reverb effect. However, if we look at the front panel and we find the word reverb, and there's a little line going up to show that these five buttons all correlate with the reverb effect. Now this way we get access to the room size, dampening, width, panning, and the reverb amount. Whereas this up here is just controlling the reverb amount. We'll get into this as we go through, but I thought that it would be worth pointing out and we'll be going through what each one of these does as well. So kicking off things, let's start with the first effect, which is level. This is pretty much the volume. So if I press play here, we can see that my snare is activated, indicated by this purple light here. If we turn this one on, we've activated the hi-hat, kick, so on. So the reason that I'm doing it this way is because if I turn effect entire on, it's going to affect all three of these. But I really just want to experiment with one of them being the snare. So I'll hit play and using this top knob, we can see level is at the top. So we twist this knob and now the volume of the snare is turned down. Can turn it up. So these LED lights here indicate the strength of the effect. You can see as I was turning it up and down that the orange light indicates the volume. And that goes for all of these. Now underneath level, we have pan, which is controlled by this knob. Now, unfortunately, my audio interface is currently being used by my microphone and by the deluge. So everything you're hearing right now is in mono. But basically what pan is doing is panning things from the left speaker or the right speaker. If you had a set of headphones plugged in or if you had two outputs going out, then you would be able to hear that effect. Next on the list is filter cutoff. To demonstrate the next effect, I'm going to create a new track and I'm just going to pick a random synth sound. Let's draw in a chord and we'll turn off our drum track. So basically this top knob is going to act as the filter and this bottom knob is going to act as the resonance. At the moment, it's set to a low pass filter, so it's going to cut off any of the high end. If we have a listen, we can hear that the higher frequencies are being completely cut off.
and we can play with the resonance to boost the cutoff point where that happens. So if we cut this down to about there and turn up the resonance, we can hear that point is starting to be increased. Now we don't just have access to a low pass filter. If we press this encoder in, we can see that high pass filter is now selected. Now for a high pass filter, we are going to be scooping the sound up and getting rid of the low end, which means that we would turn this encoder up to activate it. So let's have a listen. Again, we can play with the resonance. If we press this encoder in one more time, we get to the EQ. So rather than completely cutting off the high end or completely cutting off the low end, EQ allows us to boost or drop the high signals or boost or drop the low signals. So at the moment we can see these lights indicate that they're in the middle, so everything is flat. If we hit play, let's boost the high end a bit. Or we can drop it. And the same with the bass. So it's only a two band EQ, but this can be really, really handy when it comes to the mixing stage of finishing off your track. Finally, one last thing I forgot to mention about the low pass filter is if we click in the resonance knob, you'll see that we have drive, 12 decibels and 24 decibels. The drive filter adds a tiny bit of saturation to the lower bass tones when activated. And the 12 and 24 decibel options allow you to choose between the type of slope you want in your filter. Let's pick a different synth sound now. So going across, we have attack and release. So these are part of the envelope. And look, we're gonna be getting into like envelopes and a lot of this other stuff when we actually talk about using the synth engines to create our own sounds. But basically we have a shortcut for the attack and release options, which can also be found down here. So if we leave the attack where it is and press play, our sound starts automatically. But if we increase the attack, it's going to take longer before our sound reaches its full volume. If we just cut off this tail here, we'll see it resets every time. Now let's cut it off to about here and we'll play around with the release. So release is how long your sound will continue playing before it reaches zero in volume. So that's pretty sudden. If we increase it, Now I'm just going to start a new synth sound and change the wave type to be a sine wave and just enter in a bunch of random notes. I might just introduce a second wave just to help boost that signal a little bit. Cool. So moving on, we have delay. Now there's quite a few different options for delay. Let's play around with the delay amount to start with. If we play around with the delay time, we can choose how close we want the delayed sound to be. Have a listen. Now 
Now I would like to return this to its default stage. So have a look at the LEDs as I twist this back up. If I want to find the middle, when I find the default value, those LEDs will flash just like that. And that means that it's back to where it was. Now, you may notice that I haven't turned up the delay amount very far and I want to stay pretty much just in these two LEDs because if you turn it past that, you enter in a feedback loop for the delay, which can be really useful, but it can also be really loud. So let's have a listen. Yeah, so be really careful when playing around with the delay knob, especially if you're wearing headphones because you might blow your ears out. We have a couple of different options for delay as well. So if we press in this knob, we can switch between the normal delay, a ping pong delay. Now ping pong delay depends on having a stereo output. So at the moment we're listening to this in mono. As I said before, with the pan knob, you would need two outputs or using your headphone jack. So we're not going to hear the ping pong delay effect because we're listening to this in mono. But basically what ping pong allows you to do is have the delay offset at different speeds in the left and right channel. Now I'm just gonna switch back to normal. If we press on the bottom knob, we can choose if we want it to be a digital delay or an analog delay. Both sound slightly different and they both work in different ways. So experiment with what you like best, but just keep in mind that the analog delay uses a little bit more CPU than the digital delay. So if you have a really intense project going with lots and lots of tracks and there's a few different dropouts, that's something to keep in mind. Now I'm just going to delete that track, open up a new one and use this first bass sound. So it's gonna sound like this. I'm doing this because now we're gonna go over the sidechain effect. So basically the sidechain effect allows us to duck parts of our sound when it is triggered by the input of another sound. So if we turn our drum track on and have a listen, at the moment it sounds like this. Let's say we wanted our bass sound to duck every time there is a kick. So what I'm gonna do first is just turn up the filter on our bass track so we can really hear it. Yep, that'll do. And now with our bass track selected, we're going to hit side chain and start to turn this knob up. So every time our kick is happening, that sound is dipping. Side chaining is really, really useful for getting that pumping effect, but it's also really useful for mixing as well because quite often you won't hear your bass while your kick is playing and vice versa. Like you can, but it sort of muddies things up a little bit. So having things uh, like, you know, this is a very extreme case. I probably wouldn't have it turned up that high, but just having things duck out of the way of your kicks can be really useful in the mixing stage. Now, a quick note about sidechain. Um, let's enter in a couple of different notes here for the kick. This might sound bad, sorry. Right. So if we turn up our side chain on this again, and have a listen, it's gonna sound pretty bad. Yeah, maybe you want that, but what I like to do is get a little bit more control over the side chain. So what I'm gonna do is create a new track and just pick a different kit. Maybe that one will do. So I'm gonna enter in our four on the floor beat again. And at the moment we can hear this. What I wanna do is completely turn down the level of this sound. So now we won't be able to hear that kick at all. Another thing I wanna do is I want this to be the side chain trigger. 
So what I'll do is hold down on that sound. And we can see here on the front panel, it says side chain. If we follow that all the way to the top, there is a send button. So we'll press that. Now we can see this send option is flashing. That's the thing that we're controlling right now. So at the moment it's turned all the way up and basically the deluge automatically detects kick samples and uses it in the side chain. So we're going to leave this one turned up. However, I want this one not to be triggered by the side chain. So I'll hold this down, press send and drop this value all the way to zero. Now this bass sound will only be triggered by this clip and we can't even hear it. this one so yeah i hope that that makes sense to all of you definitely play around with these side chain options there's a lot of different things about the attack and the release you can do a lot with side chain and you can even modulate it but we'll be getting into that later now i'm just going to mute those for now and jump into our drum track Right, so let's have a look at reverb. I'm gonna leave effect entire off and we'll just affect our snare. If we turn this knob up, we'll get some reverb. So if we press this knob in, we can pick between three reverb options. We have small, medium, and large. So this is what large sounds like. It's got a longer tail on it. Small sounds kind of like you're in a room. And medium is somewhere in between. If you want more options and more control, remember that on the front panel, we have the reverb section. So we can just press shift and any one of these to enter into that. We can adjust the room size, the dampening, which is kind of like uh, throwing more people or pillows into the room, I guess the width, so if we want this to really fall across the stereo field to be a bit more contained, the panning, and the overall amount of it. Nine times out of 10, these three reverb options are good enough, but if you really want to get some more fine-tuned control, definitely play around with those. So the next effect on our list is mod rate and depth. Now, these two effects go hand in hand, the mod rate and the depth. They can only be used when effect entire is on, when they can affect your entire song. However, they can also be used for various kit clips where the mod rate and depth are controlling modulation effects, which you can set up yourself. Um, it's a little bit confusing to explain, but basically we have three different effects. We have chorus, phaser, and flanger. The rate affects the speed that those effects are applied and the depth affects how much they are applied. Just keep in mind though, that these effects mono out your signal. So as soon as they are activated, your entire mix switches to mono for a brief second until you turn it off again. Let's have a quick listen to how they sound. We'll start with chorus. Cool. Let's switch to phaser. And finally, we'll have a listen to Flanger. So yeah, pretty cool stuff. Now, if you want to use those effects on like a per clip basis, you'd need to enter into the clip and then you have these mod effects that you can use here. So if we press shift and type, we can select between flanger, chorus and phaser. Let's say we wanted the flanger on. And then these controls allow you to edit it. So we could try the feedback. Something a bit more subtle. And the rate.
So yeah, pretty cool. Now let's go over the stutter effect. Uh, this effect is kind of a weird one because uh, you can't really do much with it. You can't automate it. You can't record it into the arrangement view. And um, I think you can like, you can resample it, but it's more of a performance effect that I both love and hate at the same time. So uh, let's just turn these tracks off for now. We'll just listen to our drum track. At the moment, stutter is set in the middle. And the way to activate it is to press and hold this knob in. So you really have to catch the sound at the right time in order to activate it. We can turn this up. It's going to sound a bit different. We could turn it down. Now the real way to use this is uh, we'll reset it back to the middle. So that's kind of going to be in the middle of your tempo. And the idea is, is that you press and hold this in and then twist it as you go to let go. So let's just have a listen and play around with this. So when I do that, I twist it to the left. So I'm twisting down and then letting go. You'll notice that it resets back to the middle, which can be really, really useful. I've used that in a bunch of my tracks and performances here on YouTube, and it's really fun. However, if you twist it up, um, it's not going to reset back to the middle, which I find incredibly frustrating, but uh, let's have a look at what happens. So yeah, it can be a little bit unpredictable. The main reason that I use Stutter is because it's a really useful tool for being able to, well, yeah, like resample into the deluge to create weird rises and fills and effects and then save them to be used in other songs later. So for example, we might want to record. You know, we might want to record something like that and then chop it up and use it in different creative ways. You could use some of those sounds for drum tracks and things like that. So it can be really, really useful, especially if you're creating sounds and slightly useful if you are performing. But the fact that you have to do this manually and can't sort of control it in any other way uh, kind of makes it a little bit more of a hindrance and I tend to stay away from it unless I really have to use it. Now we've come to the final three effects, which is custom one, custom two, and custom three. Now there's nothing living in custom one. However, there are two effects that sort of live in custom two and three by default. But the idea is, is that you use these custom controls to change them and do things that you want it to do. So for example, custom two is mapped to the decimation effect. And custom three is mapped to the Bit crushing effect. So I am about to go into the mod magic section, but just as a really quick example, let's say I wanted to have the frequency knob turning for me, something like this. Basically, what I would do is map frequency to LFO one. Turn that up. And now I can change the speed of this LFO. Now, I don't want to keep having to go into this shortcut to change that. And that's where these custom effect controls come in. So now that this is flashing, we can see that the LFO rate has been activated. I'm going to select custom one, hold learn and input, and then twist this knob we can see the word learn comes up on the screen. And now this control is controlling the LFO rate. Maybe I want to use custom two 
to control how much influence that LFO has over frequency. And don't worry, we will be going into what LFOs are. So with that selected, I'm gonna press learn input, twist this top knob. Now it's just being selected a little bit. So yeah, lots of fun to be had. Now I want to get into more automation before we dive into the mod matrix section. However, uh, it should just be worth noting that there is one more effect here that isn't mapped to any of these knobs and I don't think you can map it to any of those knobs. So um, it's the saturation effect. So let's just have a listen to that being turned up. <laughs> Pretty full on, however, I find saturation really useful, especially during the mixing stage. Um, if I've turned something all the way up or I'm trying to adjust volumes or just have it stand out in a different way. For example, let's listen to our snare here. We'll turn that on. Select the snare, go saturation. Saturation and bit crushing and decimation are all distortion effects and they all live here. There's not much else that you can do with them other than select them and give them a twist, but it's just worth noting that that's where they live. Now I'm gonna go back to our bass sound here. Just remove that LFO influence. Cool. Maybe just to make it stand out a little more, we'll add on some saturation. That'll do. So let's go over a little bit of automation. Now, we already saw that we can use an LFO to modulate the frequency. Let's say we just wanted to automate one of these parameters. So for example, maybe I want to automate the filter opening all the way back up. Well, the way we would do this is press the record button. We'll make sure that this is set to a lower value. And then when it is recording, we can twist this knob and it's going to record that knob's movements. We can keep playing around with this if we want. So we can see that these lights are moving up based on what I do. That's really, really cool and all, but let's say we don't like what we did and we want to delete it. All you need to do is press shift, delete, then press that knob. Do that to the resonance as well. And now we're back where we started. So that's basically how you do automation and that works with any effect. Don't forget though that we can also do stepped automation um, or what a few other groove boxes like to call parameter locking. So uh, let's just remove this sound and we'll enter in a bunch of different notes. Great. So basically we can select any one of these notes and give it a different value. So for example, I'll select this one, change the filter, maybe the resonance. that for all of these. So yeah, that's really, really fun. If you want to see more of this, I did go over that in the sequence of video. Um, but, uh, you know, this works for drums as well. Let's say we wanted uh, the snare to have like a really loud reverb and maybe some delay on it. So 
So that's how you do stepped automation. All right, we're really wrapping things up here. I um, um, just want to go over the modulation matrix section. Now I'm starting a new synth track with a new synth sound. Great. Now I don't want to go into this too heavily because a lot of this is really going to be demonstrated when we get up to creating your own synth sounds and using the synth engine. Um, but I do want to go into it just a little bit, just to sort of show how some of it works. Basically, we can modulate a ton of these parameters using the mod matrix sources down here. We have X and Y. Now they relate to MPE controllers and I don't have an MPE controller, so I'm not going to be able to demonstrate that to you. However, we also have two envelopes, two LFOs, a side chain, note, random velocity and aftertouch. Let's create two basic chords. It's going to mute our John track. So these two envelopes relate to envelope one and envelope two. Again, we'll go into what envelopes are when we create our own synth sounds. But basically we could, for example, map the frequency cutoff to envelope two and have full control over how the frequency is modulated over time. So for example, we'll press frequency and we'll go envelope two. And now we can see that frequency is still blinking and envelope two is blinking faster. Let's turn up the value of this. Max is 50. Now we're not gonna hear anything just yet. Basically, I wanna turn this filter down. Ah. So do you hear that filter is slowly closing? So basically this filter setting is happening and, and it's defined by this envelope. Man, I'm really sorry if this isn't coming across the right way. I'm trying my best to explain this. So if we play around with the attack, maybe we'll turn the attack all the way down. And the decay will make a little shorter. So if we turn the decay up, it takes longer for that filter to take effect. Maybe we'll turn the sustain down. So that's really cool. If we press frequency and envelope two again, we can actually turn this in the other direction. And now it's gonna do the opposite. And don't forget, you don't have to have these set all the way. We could just have this influenced a little bit. So yeah, that is how the envelope section works. If we want to cancel this connection, we can just reset this value to zero and press OK. Now we can see frequency is still flashing, but it isn't mapped to anything. So let's go ahead and map frequency to LFO1 because the two LFOs, which stands for low frequency oscillator, think of it as just another wave that you can't hear. Um, these do work slightly differently. So if we press LFO1 and we turn this up. So the LFO is opening and closing our filter. We can play around with the rate by pressing LFO1 down here. We can actually sync the rate. So at the moment it's off and that's why we can use that bottle control. If we turn this up, we can sync it to happen across two bars. Maybe every second note. So that's a really good way of making sure that your LFO is synced up to your clock. And then we also have the LFO shape. So we can choose between a triangle wave, which is just going up and down, a square wave, which is going to be like this. So it's just turning on and off basically, a 
saw wave, something like this, and a sine wave, which is nice and smooth. Let's remove that connection for now and have a listen to LFO2. Turn this up. Now, do you hear that there's a little bit of a stutter there? That's basically because rather than just playing out throughout the course of your sequence, like LFO1, LFO2 is re-triggered every time a new note value is entered. So if we play around with the rate for this, that's all well and good. What we can do, however, is by pressing frequency and LFO2, we can then press this middle knob in, and we've got access to pretty much the same controls that we see here. But let's scroll down to LFO1. So we can actually modulate LFO2 with LFO1. And you can see that there's a little icon here indicating that. Now you can't do it the other way around. You cannot modulate LFO1 with LFO2, but let's have a listen for now. And we'll turn this connection up. Basically, now we can use the sync rate of LFO1 to make some changes to LFO2. So yeah, it doesn't sound too spectacular in this example. However, I have made another video on making hi-hat rhythms using those two LFO settings. So I'll make sure that I leave a link to that down below in the description, and maybe you want to use something like that. I might even include that feature sort of in the workflow section of this series once I get up to it. Now I'm just going to turn off the connections for both of those. Now we can also modulate the sidechain compressor to just about anything, just like we did with these. Uh, maybe we'll go into that a little bit more in a later video. There's also note. So depending on different note values, as you go up and down a keyboard, you can have that modulate different parameters. There's a random velocity and aftertouch. So velocity and aftertouch, again, they sort of relate to having a keyboard plugged into the deluge. And we'll probably go over that in another video as well, just adding to my video list here. Um, but random is actually pretty useful. So for example, let's just enter in a bunch of notes. Great. Let's introduce the noise oscillator. And let's map that to this random section. Now the noise will come in randomly. Again, that's more of a really useful way for creating hi-hats, but I just wanted to show that off as well. All right, so that video went a little bit longer than I anticipated, but I hope it was all very useful to you. We've now completely covered the effects section and those additional effects we'll probably get into later when we yeah, get into synthesis and the sound engine and everything. I'm hoping in the next video to cover the isomorphic keyboard layout and sort of the uh, different ways that it can be used as well as the scale feature. But for now, this is all I have time for today. Hit the like if you like, and if you don't, tell me why. Please subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.